Hey, welcome back to Past Gas, your favorite podcast by Donut Media. Uh, I'm Nolan. Uh, today with me, I have Mr. Joe Weber. Hello. And Mr. Jeremiah Burton. Hello, hello. Today on Past Gas, we are starting our two-part series on the machines of Antarctica. Dang, dude, I'm so excited for this one. <laughs> yeah, get used to enunciating Antarctica because it's hard. Is that the north part or the south part? That is the south. That is the, the south pole is located the, at the Antar- at the Antarctica. The penguins are there. Mm. Uh, they actually just drilled down like thousands of feet into this lake that hasn't even been touched in like millions of years. I just that's, that seems that's like a, the only that's anecdote how you get like this. Uh, that's how you get like that's how the thing yeah, comes. the thing right yeah yeah. Why are we messing around with that kind of stuff? Didn't we learn anything from The Thing? Ain't you ever seen a John Carpenter film? Uh, Anyway, so, yeah, to give you guys some context, dear listener, uh, we're going to start with the very beginning of Antarctic exploration and see why they needed machines in the first place. Because you know what? Kind of it's hard to get around. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you that much. There's no buses. Let's say that. Yeah, let's get that right out of the way. No Uber. (laughs) (laughs) No scooters. Uh, There will be car talk. Near the end of this episode, we just have to get there. So, get yourself some hot cocoa ready, because it's about to get cold in here. Ooh. What? Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about ports. On board his ship, the Resolution, Captain James Cook first discovered the continent of Antarctica on January 31st, 1775. After discovering quote, discovering New Zealand and circling the globe a few years prior, Cook hated that much of the Pacific (laughs) still remained unexplored. So he had returned to find what he believed to be a hidden seventh continent. Many offered to do this exploration for him, but he refused to let others hinder his imperialistic swag. Cook, (laughs) listen, you've done a lot of exploring. Let us do some exploring. Come on. No. No. No way, Jose. I'm going to that frigid seventh continent. (laughs) (laughs) So he set out to find it for himself. He had thought he discovered the continent, but he refused to row ashore and claim any land for the British Empire because the land he saw appeared inhospitable and believed it would never serve as an asset to the British Empire. As it turned out, though, James Cook had not discovered the true continent of Antarctica. Instead, he had only discovered the Sandwich Islands. Yummy. Oh, yum, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't matter to him, nor his explorations investors back in England. To him, any further southern exploration would be pointless, as the southern sea was just too dangerous and it was just cold outside. <laughs> <laughs> the icebound continent was now globally understood to be a worthless asset, but time would soon challenge that idea. Cook never got the chance to be proven wrong, though, as he was dismembered and killed on a Hawaiian beach in 717. Yeah, uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, Shortly after he, quote, again, discovered Hawaii's existence. Well, at least he was in a Hawaiian place. Mahalo, baby. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Because of Cook, Britain did not, yeah, James Cook, not a good guy. I just want to say that. Uh, Britain did not have any intention to explore the frozen wasteland, but there was a different sentiment over in Russia. In 1819, Tsar Alexander I dispatched two Pacific expeditions with the sole intention of discovering the Antarctic continent. He knew there would be some scientific benefits to such an exploration, but what he really wanted to demonstrate was his control. To Alexander, the control of both the North and South Poles would be a global demonstration of the Tsar's power to the entire world. Kind of mirrors like, like Russian history has been like that forever, where they're just like, we want the power. Russia has a very complicated and super interesting history. Yeah. Yeah. It is kind of funny to think the guy was like, I want top of world. I want bottom of world. (laughs) Middle part? Not that important. <laughs> it's a little sweaty down there. <laughs> also, it's hilarious because like most of Russia's is like frozen wasteland, and they're like, mm-hmm. "I want more. <laughs> I want more of that." Yo, shout out to our Russian listeners if Hell you're yeah. out there, man. What up, Dimitri? Keep it, keep it, go- keep it going, yeah, man. Yeah. On January twenty seventh, eighteen twenty, the Russian expeditions crossed the Antarctic Circle. It was the second expedition to have ever done so, and just one day later, the crew of the Russian ship. 
the Vostok reported sighting of the continent. Though once again, the discovery was only uh, some more islands close to Antarctica. Ah, these sandwich islands again! (laughs) (laughs) It's pretty hard to discover land if it's made out of ice, mountains, and snow. The first actual, actual sighting of Antarctica was by a small American crew of seal hunters in February 1821. Uh, but the sighting was swept under the rug as only, quote, real explorers could make such a discovery. Would you ever eat seal meat? I couldn't do that, no. No, they're too I, cute. Yeah, they're too dang cute. I would imagine it to be very, like, fatty. Oh, yeah. Almost like oh, the, for sure. the goose of Ooh. Uh, cows or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, now I kind of, mm, I don't know, it sounds good. Uh, <laughs> In one fell swoop, you yeah. just said the goose of cows, and it changed no one's mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can you imagine being a seal hunter in 1821? Like, there's what a, kind of person's uh, doing that? There's nothing more <laughs> that I could think of <laughs> on a boat in the water, freezing your freezing off. your balls. Yeah, your off. yeah. It's like, and then you have to like, you can't just shoot them. You have to club them. Yeah, you have to beat the <laughs> shit out of them. Can't do it. Um, James Cook had described the land as inexpressibly horrid in every aspect. Uh, at this point in time, the existence of Antarctica had yet to actually be proven. But a race to be the first to truly discover the continent had begun. First, it was the Russians that wanted a peace, like we said. Then the French came along, then the British and the Americans, and even Chile at a point. A joint German-Norwegian exploration team was formed to try to claim some of the land. What made this team unique, though, was the people it was composed of. The majority of the group were whalers, tough men who knew a thing or two about being cold. <laughs> hey, I like being cold. <laughs> uh, they were the closest to experts on the terrain that existed at the time. Now, finally, the first actual landing on Antarctica was by another group of seal hunters in 1853, but nobody cared, and the Norwegian expedition declared themselves the first people to ever step foot on the land on January 24th, 1875. The feeling of being the first people to have ever stepped foot on an, on the new land was, quote, strange yet pleasurable uh, until at least the locals attacked. It took <laughs> two hours to fight off a colony of Adele penguins with sticks, but once they hunted a few seals, uh, they left after that. So I guess so they got attacked by penguins. And then they killed some seals and then they bounced. Uh. I think that's so crazy that these people from like the top of the world just go all the way down here yeah <laughs> no, like, fight some penguins eat a seal and then they're like okay huh. let's, let's Later. Back. we did it <laughs> the norwegian whalers arrived to prove that landing was possible their return to the land would be accompanied by a wave of scientists and explorers they had unknowingly kicked off what would become the quote heroic age of antarctic exploration that would dominate the early 20th century If you don't know much about the terrain of Antarctica, it sucks. A lot. (laughs) Original explorers did not see much commercial gain from the continent. They saw tremendous scientific value for their home countries, though, specifically Britain. Britain has a nasty habit of wanting to dominate every piece of land in sight. Uh, So most things were done in the view of how could this benefit Britain? Well, there is ice. (laughs) We need ice for our iced tea. (laughs) Don't don't people in Europe typically not like ice in their beverage? Yeah, yeah. Oh, is, that's true. It's so weird. Mm. So there might have been something else there. Just go down to the pub and have a warm Dr. Pepper, mate. Yeah. It's funny <laughs> it's funny that like after a hundred years of this place, people like they go down there, they see it, they're like, There's nothing here. And then it's like they forget fifty years later, another like, group of people. Get our- you gotta there. get down there. There's important stuff. They get down there. There's nothing. Ice. There yeah. might be ore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll get there, Joe. A big thank you to Simply Safe for sponsoring this episode. Simply Safe Home Security is like getting a commercial grade, enterprise level security, but for your own home. Think about the security that Fortune 500 companies use. You know, I think about that stuff all the time. How do they do that? They need to know that the police are going to be on the scene immediately in the case of anything going wrong. And this is exactly the kind of security you get with Simply Safe. You might say, My doors are safe, Nolan, but what if a hamburglar tries to smash through my window and steal my stuff? Yeah, that's a good point. Simply Safe has entry, motion, and 
glass brake sensors inside, as well as outdoor cameras and doorbell alerts to let you know someone's trying to steal your hamburgers. If there's a break-in, Simply Safe uses real video evidence to give police an eyewitness account of the crime. And that means police dispatch up to 350% faster than for a normal burglar alarm. Go to simplysafe.com slash gas today to get free shipping on your order plus a 60-day money-back guarantee. That's awesome, guys. 60 days. That's two months. That's simplysafe.com slash G-A-S to save on home security today. Simplysafe.com slash gas. Thank you, Simply Safe. A uh, private expedition skyrocketed in hopes to claim the land for Britain. Britain took the lead uh, when it came to the expeditions, but the Germans also wanted a little peace. Kaiser Wilhelm II wanted to, wanted to dominate the southern seas solely for prestige and glory and began sending expeditions down to claim territory for Germany. Everyone's just freaking going down there. In 1901, the British ship Discovery departed from London's East India docks. On board were two men who had become the most infamous explorers of all time, Ernest Shackleton and Robert Falcon Scott. Really good names. Yeah, those, those are, are sick. Ball and yeah. names. Yeah. On this expedition, they explored nearly 560 kilometers inland and were officially claimed all of Antarctica for Britain. Much like when the U.S. astronauts landed on the moon, so we basically claimed the moon, right? We own the moon. We own the moon. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. U.S.A. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Other countries claimed that the land was obviously too vast to be conquered by a single run like that, so they continued sending more and more expeditions. In 1907, Shackleton set off aboard the Nimrod in an attempt to claim the or to conquer the pole and undisputably conquer the land for Britain. Okay, wait. Quick aside for Nimrod. A lot of people think it means dumb now, but that's only because of a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Nimrod was actually like an accomplished hunter in old Greek lore. Whoa. So it was, he was saying it ironically to Elmer Fudd because oh. uh, he wasn't a good hunter. Yeah. And so then people mistook it for or cut uh, down or, yeah, put down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But Nimrod was actually like, in, like, a like a good a, hunter. Like it's such a great insult in yeah, the context I know. of that cartoon, but people yeah. they got the meaning got totally taken away. Yeah. Interesting. Shackleton claimed the exploration was for scientific purposes, but in reality, he knew that being the first to conquer the pole would bring him great fortune and fame. Hey, you discovered Antarctica. Here's a bag of money. Right? But, you, but you really didn't, because a couple people did it before <laughs> yeah. you. You <laughs> discovered a beach on Antarctica. <laughs> you just you just stuck a flag in the ground and said, I declare it's mine. <laughs> and I guess people, you know, history goes to those who... Uh, what, what, what's the phrase? Plant flags. That's right. That was it. Whoa. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> As he had learned from his previous expedition with Scott, he needed to bring two things. First, he brought a pistol so he could dispose of horses as soon as they could, had completed their job. I'm bringing a bunch of horses just to shoot on the beach of Antarctica. <laughs> Second, he brought an automobile. Uh, his goal was to determine if a car would be capable of eliminating all need for animals in future expeditions. This four-cylinder, 15-horsepower, air-cooled beast uh, was provided for his journey. Shackleton claimed that his automobile would be capable of traveling up to 150 miles in 24 hours under favorable conditions. But those claims would prove to be just claims. There's no way an old car like that would be able to do no that. And can you imagine... Mm-hmm. Like getting in your car in the morning in Antarctica and like waiting it for it to warm up. Oh, jeez. As soon as the car was lifted onto the ice, it only moved a few feet before stalling out. <laughs> After a quick tune-up, the car ran, but it was obviously that it wouldn't work. The petrol engine had not been tested in extreme cold, and there's no adequate way to combat the lack of traction. The car could barely start, and it was abandoned shortly after the expedition had begun. Uh, Though Shackleton and his ponies carried on, the ponies did horribly in the snow, too. They barely lasted longer than the car because they don't have any fur. Horses don't have fur, right? Well, ponies ponies just have little legs. (laughs) Yeah, like little little thin legs. legs. They don't have camel feet that can spread out. No, they they need donkeys with big old... Big, Big old, old hooves. <laughs> Snowshoes. <laughs> Snowshoes, yeah. That's kind of f***ed up to bring some ponies. You know, like, the whole place is snowing, you yeah. know? Like, has this guy ever been in a snow... Like, you can just, like, f- you know, 
again. I have long legs, and even I've walked in snow that's gone up to my to my waist. Well, you know, yeah, that's that's the size of a pony. <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, the a constant theme of the show that we run into is just hubris and just being like, "Hey, we'll do it. It's fine." Yeah, and yeah. then just failure once they get there. Yeah, it seems <laughs> so, like they didn't put any thought into no. it. They're just like, it was a different time. We got back some then. extra space on the ship. Let's just, uh, <laughs> oh, we got these six ponies. Yeah. Uh, the expedition was forced to end within a hundred miles of the pole. Wow. Uh, although some people claim the number was fudged to make Shackleton look better. We don't really know how close he could have gone like 500 yards and been like, I'm just going to tell people. Like, <laughs> yeah. We're going to wait here for a few weeks and then we'll go back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> They began running low on supplies, and they're almost out of ponies to eat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the real yeah. reason they brought them. Yeah. The guy was just like, well, they might be useful, but if not, they'll be yeah. food. We didn't bring any food because we took all the space <laughs> up with all these ponies. Yeah, uh, They chose ponies because they couldn't figure out how to control the dogs well enough to use them on dog sled teams. Uh so that was the real reason yeah. they didn't do dogs. They just didn't want to spend the time to train the dogs. And apparently the dogs they brought were also eaten. <laughs> so good. Great, like, uh, post-Christmas episode. Geez. If you like animals at all, you've bailed early on because of the seal stuff. But if you made it through it, yeah. you're just now you're just you're like, horrified. Right, because to... People in the early, what, 20th century were a bunch of dicks. So, yeah, it was pretty clear that animals were not suited to this environment. So it was time to design a machine that made the animals obsolete. Rolled out. Amundsen was a Norwegian explorer who had made himself famous a year earlier in 1906 by discovering and navigating the treacherous Northwest Passage above Canada, beating Britain to the prize. He was a passionate explorer and believed the only way to explore was to use the environment to your advantage. Sponsorships for explorations were pouring in from everywhere to every explorer. All people wanted was to discover the South Pole, and governments and newspapers would pay you a pretty penny to attach their name to that discovery. I love, like, even before, going back to the first guy who did this, he was on a spot, like, he was paid. Yeah. Like, that would be your job. Hey, here's some money from the, the king or queen or government. Yeah. Go find new land. You know, so no wonder why there was a lot of pressure to bring back stuff. So when he did find it, he was like, there's, there's nothing down there. And now it's just full circle again. Yeah. They're trying to find some sweet gold in that snow. <laughs> <laughs> but not the gold snow. No, you don't <laughs> want that. No, you don't no, want yeah. that. The real race to the poles began as soon as people learned that it could make you rich. The main competing countries were Britain, Germany, Norway, and now Japan was in on the races too. Everyone wanted a piece of that sweet polar pie, baby. Sounds really good. Sounds like that uh, 31 Flavors uh, treats a pizza. <laughs> I Yum, don't... dude. Remember the, ch- remember the Choco Taco? <laughs> oh, so I... dude, don't sleep yeah. on a Choco Taco. They're so good. They're so good. Oh, man. Uh, when an ice, man, ice cream man comes to ring in, that's my number one order. What if all Choco the food taco. they took down to Antarctica was just <laughs> ice cream? <laughs> it would stay cold, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Ice cream and horse meat. <laughs> <laughs> On September 8th, 1911, Roald Amundsen, now representing Norway, set sail to reach the South Pole. He hoped the accomplishment in the South would help him further fund future explorations in the North. His biggest competitor, Robert Falcon Scott, had set sail in January but had been delayed to due to issues with his ship. So at that time, Amundsen had the lead over Scott, but that lead was quickly shunted as soon as they met intense cold weather of negative 56 degrees Celsius Ooh. in Antarctica. What's that conversion, Nolan? They Wait, let's guess on it. What do you think 50, 56 below C is? Wasn't well, it 32 plus f- like five-fourths of whatever it is? <laughs> I don't know. Let's say minus, uh, minus 120. I think minus 65. Minus 68.8. Ooh. Wow, look at that. Dude, that's freaking cool. Like, and they didn't have clothes. They didn't have hot hands. You know those no, hot no. hands? Yeah. yeah, they didn't have that. They just had seal pelts. Yeah. Amundsen was forced to wait until October 15th to finally set sail for the South Pole. Good Lord. Isn't that, 
that's yeah, that's a terrible time. Well, hold on, is it October four? You're getting into winter. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. You're, yeah. And does it like Antarct- Antarctica probably gets bigger in winter, right? Yeah, like you sure. probably have more land to go. Oh yeah. The more it freezes. Yeah. This marked the beginning of one of the most famous exploration races in history, the Amundsen Scott Race to the Pole. Oh, now I now I remember. Yeah. <laughs> Overall, Amundsen's exploration went without a hitch. His team of five men, uh, including him, successfully raised the Norwegian flag over the South Pole on December 15th, 1911. While Amundsen was raising his flags, Scott was more than 480 kilometers away from the South Pole, which, why? I don't know why this is all metric. Can I guess? Yeah, sure. Uh, 120. Uh, 480, I think that's uh, 300 miles. 298.2. Joe's hey! on a roll, dude. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> and that's kind of what set Amundsen and Scott apart. Amundsen worked with the environment, you know, adapting to the requirements of the harshest terrain on Earth. Scott, on the other hand, wanted to conquer it. He believed that he had, with a heavy enough fist, he could shape the land to obey him. But he lost, so that didn't really work. So I think Rold was right. Sorry, this is kind of out of order, but I remember this uh, Shackleton's expedition. They a lot of their ship was taken up by whiskey. Oh my god! They had crates and crates of whiskey, but in 2010 they found. Whoa. All this whiskey. And so there's like crates of whiskey that's like over 100 years old. And down in the Antarctica, was, they found it? Yeah. yeah. And it oh. was still good. It was like because the snow had like, they didn't yeah. know where their camp was because the snow had kind of like covered it. Yeah. And then they finally found it with like sonar. And then they found all these crates of whiskey. Wow. I'd like to have some of that. Yeah. And it's still good. They said it has a lovely aroma. Wow. <laughs> Uh, so Scott had brought with him three motor li- motorized sleds that rode on um, tracks instead of dogs. <laughs> <laughs> on paper, it would be the savior of the expedition. They could carry tons of necessary resources, uh, but actually, in reality, they failed spectacularly. And they you... also didn't run on gas. They ran on pony blood. <laughs> <laughs> Much like Shackleton's attempted use of the motor car, the sleds turned into little more than a publicity stunt. One of the three sleds was lost almost immediately during unloading. Uh, when it was unloaded onto thin ice, it plunged into the ocean. <laughs> oh my God. What are these guys doing? Uh, this is like the if the Dudesons, yeah. they sent the Dudesons to go explore Antarctica. <laughs> the other two were so inefficient on loose snow that they're forced to be abandoned after only 50 miles. <laughs> I wanted to guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're just... I, I, I feel like it would be the equivalent of us making a rover that goes to Mars and not testing it in like the sands of yeah. Dubai or something. Oh, or like someplace that is most equivalent to NASA's that. like scratching their head like, why did we send so much whiskey up to Mars? <laughs> <laughs> it was the failure of these sleds that would prove to be Scott's downfall. Before long, Scott and his men were forced to haul the sleds themselves. What a waste of time. The extra effort caused by the hauling meant that his men were slowly starving to death. Uh, it was not until January of 1912 that he had he and his men finally reached the pole, uh, which, by which time Amundsen had already, he was already returning to base. <laughs> they they passed him, they're like, hey, yeah. we did it. We've See already it. put the flag there. <laughs> it's not worth it, don't. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's nothing down there. There's Scott- not a Sabaro. <laughs> <laughs> Scott was not thrilled to see the numerous Norwegian flags planted <laughs> at the poles. <laughs> no shit. Uh, oh my gosh. Weighed down by scurvy, frostbite, and failure, they began the long trek back to base. Scott collected rocks <laughs> to, <laughs> to bring oh back God. as proof that the entire journey was for <laughs> scientific purposes. Though it's pretty obvious Scott only tried because he wanted to be the first to claim the land for Britain. Um, the extra weight of 14 kilograms of rock sealed his team's fate. Soon they began dying one by one. They were within 200 kilometers of salvation, but Scott insisted they remain in their tents to, quote, die like gentlemen. It took nine days for (laughs) all three remaining men to die. The thing that's funny about this is that he went and saw a bunch of flags and then like, if it was me, how are they going to know? Just pull up the flags yeah. and then put your own flag. 
And yeah. the, but even if you did that, who's going to know? Yeah. You don't know when you could just lie. There's like a seal with a little camera. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Did they take pictures? I mean, obviously they took pictures. I see some stuff here, but you know, you could probably fake it. It doesn't oh look God. like anything. Uh, Scott had failed due to his, uh, I would say, hubris and incompetence, but pre-war Britain needed a hero for morale, so they made do and transformed Scott's legacy and turned him into a national hero. Uh, despite the poll now being under Norway's claim, the British government understood that the public support for their fallen hero would only convince people to support further exploration of Antarctica. Only a few people at, at the time knew that Scott's lack of knowledge, adaptability, and Less than stellar preparedness were to blame for his failure, so he was openly accepted as a hero in the history books. Both Scott and Abenson had one thing in common. They both viewed Antarctica as a path to greater things, specifically that fame and fortune. Douglas Mawson, on the other hand, was like no one anyone had ever seen before. He didn't care about money or fame. He just wanted to check out that sweet, sweet ice. <laughs> Mawson reasoned that the coastline nearest Australia, obviously, should be under the control of Australia and secured funding from the Australian and British government for his expedition. To drum up public support, his wife thought that an aircraft could really increase his popularity, and it did. But almost immediately, the plane flipped and crashed into an airfield oh during an air show. But Mawson was not the type of man to let a small airplane crash stop him. So he removed the plane's wings and retrofitted it as an air tractor sledge. And if you look at these pictures here, it's just a looks like a plane fuselage with skis on the bottom. That's a really good idea. It's freaking cool. Yeah. I don't get. So he was at an air show in Britain. Like, or Australia. Or Australia showing off his plane. Yeah. His sled plane. Yeah. Okay. And then crashed, and he's like, well, we could still use the propeller. <laughs> Mawson brought two new pieces of technology with him as well. First, he brought a color camera, uh, but more importantly, he brought a radio. His radio helped connect him to the outside world during his expeditions and proved to be a major milestone in the advancement of industrialization of Antarctic travel. I think it's funny that they brought a color camera to a place that's <laughs> white and gray. <laughs> that's hilarious, yeah. yeah. Uh so yeah, the stories this week are pretty much ones of tragedy and failure, but they served a greater purpose. It was these failures that really set the stage for what would become one of the most innovative exploration races in history. Within a matter of decades, people went from pulling sleds with dogs to transporting themselves in a giant bus that was designed to comfortably house four people. It was these revolutionary stories that would inspire one of the most well-funded and little-known failures of the entire Antarctic research expedition the Snow Cruiser. Ooh. Mm. It's like when people, you can like buy a star or yeah. like put your name on a star. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like, dog, that's a planet that <laughs> aliens live on. Yeah, you can't claim, like, <laughs> what if you did buy a star and then you somehow were able to finance a trip to it and you get there and you're like, hey, man. This is my star. Yeah. There's like billions of people there. Oh my God, Nolan Land is so much more beautiful. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> We're on Crablar 9. Yeah. <laughs> Crablar 9. That was from that That's a callback, <laughs> yeah. Wow, we spent so much effort on the yeah, episode. <laughs> we made a musical episode last year for our 50th Wheelhouse uh, episode and uh, didn't do very well. <laughs> it, it was, was really fun to make, It was though. so much fun. Uh, okay. Thomas Poulter was a veteran and explorer of the Antarctic continent. In his first trip to the icy south, he accompanied fellow explorer and retired Navy Admiral Richard E. Byrd. This trip almost ended with Admiral Byrd dying of carbon monoxide poisoning caused by improper ventilation in his weather observation cabin. Sporadic and cryptic radio messages caused by the poisoning tipped Poulter off that something might be wrong, so he drove a tractor from home base out to the cabin and saved Admiral Byrd's life. And then Poulter took over that important weather observation. Yeah, so carbon monoxide poisoning like makes you act like it f***s your head. Like it makes you act pretty weird. Yeah. So he was in a, so let me get this straight. So he's in a. Like a little cabin. Like a little cabin a little and hut. has some sort of motor. Right, it was a uh, like a fireplace, and there wasn't enough uh, ventilation. Ventilation, okay. So like smoke was coming back in ah. to the cabin, oh, shit. Uh -huh. and it just started like depriving him of oxygen. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. you you get like massive migraines, 
and you start to forget things mm-hmm. that you did. So, <laughs> like, some guy was waking up. Uh, some guy that had a, mon- a carbon monoxide leak in his house is waking up with little post-its. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he was like, is someone sneaking into my house and writing these little post-it notes? Right. And then they, like, found out later that he w- had just, like, a leak in his house, and he was writing these things, and he kept forgetting that he was doing it. Wow. I remember <laughs> Eddie, one of our editors, lived with me for a while, and we had improperly installed our oven <laughs> and didn't use silicone or, uh, like... <laughs> like tape over the the fittings teflon and tape. teflon tape yeah. and there's like gas would like slowly leak out and eddie would he slept on the lower on the first level and he would like wake up every day with like splitting headaches so Ooh. he was probably getting poisoned oh my yeah. god oh my gosh <laughs> i love i love that with this sporadic and cryptic radio messages so he'd just hop on the radio and I'd be, be like, like hey <laughs> Hey, Thomas. <laughs> hey, is ketchup a smoothie? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. think something's wrong with Admiral. <laughs> with yeah. the Admiral. Um, okay, so upon returning home, Thomas Poulter got a job at the Armor Research Foundation at the Armor Institute of Technology, which is now the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. And he would soon begin work on them, his most infamous contribution to Antarctic exploration, the snow cruiser. As we discussed in our last episode, people had been checking out the South Pole for decades, just (laughs) checking it out. Um, But the U.S. had a vested interest in having a big presence in Antarctica, especially in the late 30s, because Nazis were a thing now, and Uncle Sam did not want them to have a foothold on Penguin Land. Uh, (laughs) Throwing some speculation now that there might be some gold or oil and other precious resources hiding out under the ice... It wasn't enough for the U.S. to just plant some flags. They needed to have a physical presence and a way to get around. Thomas Poulter and his team got to work on making that happen. It was critical that the craft also double as a residence for scientists and triple as a research lab for those scientists. This means the machine was going to be big. The craft would be nearly 56 feet long, 20 feet wide and 16 and a half feet tall. Dang. It would be powered by two 150 horsepower Cummins diesel generators that powered an electric motor in each of the wheels. Oh, that's interesting. Almost like a Chevy Volt does, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. That's like those big rock crews are, you know, in in mines that they use, you know, to build or to haul. Oh, yeah. Like those are all electric motors powered by. Yeah, because you can't have like gas down there. Yeah. yeah right. <clears throat> That's pretty cool. (laughs) To make sure each of the generators had enough fuel, the fuel tank had a capacity of 2,500 gallons, along with another 1,000 gallons for aircraft fuel because a freaking ski plane would live on top of this thing. To be strong enough for all that weight, the cruiser would be constructed entirely from steel, meaning this behemoth weighed in at 75,000 pounds fully loaded. So I already see a problem with this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What would that be, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> it's a heavy boy. It's a heavy boy on the, the softest <laughs> ground. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's like, well, uh, it's, don't get too pessimistic. Okay. So this Thomas Poulter, is this the guy who is designing he's this? He's designing this thing. Okay. Yes. So he, and he's an American? He's an American. Okay. He's designing the snow cruiser. Right. Does he have any experience building any other kind of vehicle? Well, I think the results will answer that question. Okay. Uh, the team anticipated that the snow cruiser, or penguin as it was known, would have to cross some pretty gnarly crevasses, right? That's a problem. What if a wheel gets stuck? Boys, you're screwed. They came up with a clever solution. Each of the penguin's wheels could be retracted into the hull of the craft, kind of like some landing gear on a plane. Say you come up to a crevasse, guys. Okay. You could pull up one of the wheels. <laughs> like a, or the like f- a penguin's foot, how yeah. it goes into it. Yeah, its... that's cute. But uh, so, like, so it can raise up not vertically ra- or No, in? It, would, it would raise in. So like okay. you're coming up on a crevasse yep. uh, and your front wheel gets like into the crevasse, mm-hmm. but the, the it's so freaking long, the wheels are kind of mounted closer to the... the middle of the car rather than the ends of it so like the front end of the vehicle would support the weight of the rest of the thing while a the wheels would retract up the back wheels would then push the car over the crevasse your front wheels would come up now that they're on solid ground you'd retract the rear wheels and pull the car out wow yeah okay did it have so it had like a uh, basically flat bottom or like yes a, very okay. flat bottom for people who don't know 
I mean, I do. Yeah. But a crevasse <laughs> is like a big crack in the ground. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Glad I mean... we cleared that up. <laughs> I knew that. Yeah, no, you're good. I think the worst way to die would to be like fall into a crevasse and then just like suffocate. Wedged. Yeah. yeah oh my not, God. I don't like 127 hours, but being cold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah. <laughs> this is a pretty brilliant solution. Uh, the Snow Cruiser rode on 10 foot high Goodyear tires uh, that were tested on the sand dunes of Lake Michigan. The Snow Cruiser's support trucks for the test got stuck in the sand, while the enormous contact patch ensured that the penguin floated over the sand. The nine square feet of contact evenly distributed the weight over a very large area, kind of like how tanks work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Nine square feet per wheel or total? I think total, yeah. That's pretty big. Yeah. Because, like, on your car, it's probably, like, at best, like... It's inches, right? Yeah. Like a... A foot square patch, maybe? I don't know. I don't know either. Um, so that's pretty awesome. It's weird they tested it in sand, though. It, right? Hmm. Sand is different than snow. Yeah, I think it's I think it's got similar properties. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, guys. Okay. Yeah. I think it, I think it's like soft. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would just think, you know it would make sense you're in Illinois. Maybe wait for some snow to test it in. Right. Or if you're building a multi-million dollar thing that you want to succeed, go to a place and build it where it's snowing already, <laughs> like Alaska. <laughs> the groundbreaking engineering going into the Snow Cruiser wasn't cheap. It cost $150,000 to build, which is about $2.8 million today. But with all that important research and possible oil that was bound to be found, the Snow Cruiser was sure to pay itself off. There was just one problem. They built it in Chicago. They needed the the snow cruiser to be in Boston to be shipped mm, out. That seems like <laughs> not a huge deal. <laughs> Antarctic is just like a big black cloud over everything. <laughs> yeah. uh, the snow cruiser left for Boston on October 24th, 1939. The, the snow cruiser had to be driven, and that had an immediate effect on traffic. The penguin had a top speed of oh 30 God. miles per hour. But worse, it was 20 feet wide, which means you couldn't pass it without going off the road entirely. And oncoming traffic had to get off the road to let it pass. It took a week to get to Ohio, oh God. where the crew encountered a bridge they had to cross. Only one problem, though. It was also 20 feet wide, which just left a few inches of clearance on either side of the cruiser. It took three hours with a man on every corner of the craft to cross the bridge. Wow. What a disaster. <laughs> Can you imagine getting stuck behind this thing? Oh, my God. Let's yeah. go! <laughs> I gotta get to the factory! <laughs> <laughs> a few days later, they found another bridge, uh, and this time it wouldn't be so easy to get across. The snow cruiser broke down, and it took the crew three days to get it off the bridge. I'm pretty sure I was stuck behind this guy in traffic this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they finally got to Boston and set off by ship to Antarctica on November 15th. It took them 22 days to get there from Chicago. Uh, when the crew was unloading the craft from the ship, one of the front wheels broke through the wooden <laughs> ramp. The three men on top of the snow cruiser at the time almost fell off the craft. They got it off the boat, drove a few feet, and uh, then they found a problem. What's the problem, Nolan? Tell us. The snow cruiser could not drive on snow. <laughs> Hey, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Sand and snow are like the same thing. <laughs> uh, they found that the electric motors were severely underpowered for the job, but worse, the tires were also completely unfit for it. And that's because they were completely smooth with no tread at all. <laughs> Come on, y'all. You got snow. Just spent, like, wait for winter, test it out. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> I just love it. Because you know why? Because engineers built this. And engineers, like I said during the PT Cruiser podcast, you remember? Mm -hmm. Engineers are a bunch of idiots. <laughs> they really are. Because they don't ever like go out and test stuff the way it should be done. They're, they're indoor just, people. Yeah, they're indoor. Like They're not practical. And you know what? As someone who was one, I can say that. So f*** all you other. <laughs> I'm an engineer too. <laughs> yeah. Audio engineer, but <laughs> same thing. I'm as smart as you. It's the same thing. <laughs> right? I was a, a sandwich engineer when I worked at uh, <laughs> 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 the Vaughn's Deli there. 
<laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, the crew tried to fix the situation by installing the cruisers. They brought two spare tires with them. Okay. Uh, they, they attached those to the uh, front axle. Um, that still didn't really help, though. So they put chains over all the tires, and that did help. Um, the snow cruiser was able to move with that modification, but only in reverse. Um, and what? Why? It, that's just how it is. I think I imagine like weight balance, maybe. Oh, okay. Um, so the could long- be the only way that it could gain traction. Uh, the longest trip the snow cruiser ever made was ninety-two miles, in reverse. Um, so the decision was made to just park it, but continue using the onboard research equipment. The crew took ice samples. They monitored seismic activities and measured cosmic rays from the sun. Um, the journey might have been a total failure, but the important work still got done. However. It did not help that the ski plane on top of the uh, the snow cruiser threw a rod and could no longer be flown, so they just left that as well. As conditions got colder, the crew covered the snow cruiser in snow to help insulate it and keep themselves warm. It seems like uh, like exploring Antarctica in like the 30s is kind of the same way we're exploring Mars now. Where we're like we're sending our best technology, but it's still just kind of like you're still finding the weak the weak spots. Yeah, this sure. thing is still puttering around, like taking yeah. low res pictures, <laughs> <laughs> picking up rocks. <laughs> 1941 rolled around and brought World War II with it, and that pretty much killed any public interest in the snow cruiser project. Because you know at the time it was a pretty big deal. It was this huge thing. People lined the roads to watch it go by on its journey to Boston. Like, it was a pretty big deal, you know? Um, but, you know, then the war happened and they're like, just more important stuff to to do. The crew was brought back to the States and the snow cruiser was left on the ice in the uh, on the southernmost continent. Two separate expeditions uh, happened upon the snow cruiser on their trip. The first was in 1946, after the war, during a U.S. Navy exercise called Operation Humpback. Then in 1958, another expedition found the craft thanks to a marker pole sticking up out of the snow. The crew on that expedition actually used the cruiser as a shelter and reported that basic maintenance was all that needed to uh, get the car (laughs) running again. (laughs) That's pretty wild. Pretty reliable. Unfortunately, though... I don't think the snow cruiser is ever going to run again. Oh, man, I had really high hopes. The snow cruiser hasn't been found since 1958, uh, and there are a few, prevail- uh, a few prevailing theories as to why. The first is that the snow cruiser fell into the ocean when a large portion of the Ross ice shelf uh, broke off in the 60s. The second and way more exciting theory, in my opinion, is that the Soviets captured the snow cruiser and smuggled it off of Antarctica to reverse engineer it and build their own snow cruiser, although that sounds a little far-fetched. Yeah, because you would need a bigger vehicle cruiser. to like tow it back, and I don't think that was going to happen. Also, wh- why would you care about re-engineering a piece of yeah. shit? <laughs> we need to it's look not good. at technology and make round big tires. <laughs> Sleek tires. <laughs> yeah, like the Russians probably looked at that thing and were like, well, that's garbage. We could build our own. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing. You know, we could make work. a bomb out of it. <laughs> right. Uh, Antarctic exploration and research is still kicking today, and they have all sorts of vehicles to help get them around. One of them is the Tucker Snowcat, which is pretty much a box on a set of four tracks. Uh, whatever you're imagining right now, listener, that's probably accurate to what I'm seeing those little is. like triangle tracks, right? N- As wheels? Uh, no. No. Just the regular, like, oval kind of wheels. Okay. Or oval track. You know what I'm saying. Uh, (laughs) They use uh, the the Tucker Snowcat to make little short trips and tow things. It's like a tractor. Um, For long-distance trips over the continent, the vehicle of choice is the Haglund, which is another very boxy design, but this time split between two cabs on two tracks each. So, like, two really boxy tanks attached to each other. There's tons of room to, like, carry supplies and people. Uh, they're very, and they can be used as shelters. Apparently, another popular choice is the Humvee, but with those sick triangle tracks that you were talking oh, about yeah. earlier. Mm-hmm. That's the way uh, to go. And a sleeper cab built onto the back, so that's pretty sick. Nowadays, besides scientific research, there's also a surprising amount of touristy stuff to do in Antarctica. Um, in case this series has made you want to check it out, it makes it sound very appealing. <laughs> <laughs> We've really set the stage for people to want to 
yeah. get down there. Yeah. Uh, you can go kayaking, go camping. You want to hear something crazy? There was actually a Tinder date in oh, Antarctica. Hell yeah. Two researchers found each other on Tinder and went on a nice. date. There's only one ATM on Antarctica. And it's like on the other side, and they're like, yeah. <laughs> so who owns who owns Antarctica? Is it a it's, is it their own country? It's it's kind of split up. So, yeah. Uh, countries have claimed parts of it, like Russia's claimed parts of it, Norway's claimed parts, uh, America's claimed parts, but no one has, I don't think, claimed like the South Pole. Okay. I think that's been like, like not a not a treaty or anything, but like. Mm-hmm. An agreement. Yeah, we all kind of agree that it's just like, that it's not worth yeah the trouble. Uh, speaking of like different partitions, uh, Ukraine has some of their own territory, and there's a bar there um, that uh, sells homemade vodka for three dollars a shot. So if you want to go check that out, wait, why are like why a, is alcohol less expensive there than in LA? <laughs> Way less expensive. I went to a bar. And they were selling Jameson shots for twelve dollars. Oh my Ugh. god, that's terrible. Yeah, gag me with a spoon. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? It, I just realized that, like anyone can kind of go anywhere and lay claim to whatever land. Yeah, you just have to have a bigger military. <laughs> yeah, basically. But so, you could go down there and be like, "This is my land," and no one could do anything yeah. unless. You know, Um, the Russian army shows up and kicks your ass off of it. You know what's happening with Greenland right now? Because all the ice is melting and they're, like, getting more access to land, there's, like, some rare earth metals. And so Trump made, like, said that dumb shit about, like, him trying to buy Greenland. Yeah, yeah. But it's actually becoming kind of an issue where, like, I think the Netherlands own has claim to it now. But, like, as these, as it becomes more valuable, like... It could. It's possible that there could be like a war over it or something like that. Sure. Wait, Greenland's not its own country, or it doesn't is. have a government. Oh, it's kind of the way I think that like, uh, you know, Canada's associated with England or Great oh, Britain. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's like they discovered it, and it's kind of like gotcha. It's its own. It's not a sovereign nation. I don't know. I I sound like an idiot talking <laughs> about, it, but. Uh, so it's nether- an autonomous territory within okay. the kingdom of Denmark. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so like, l- yeah, like Joe's saying, you know, Britain has all these territories, and so this is just one, but it's for Denmark. Yeah. Yeah. So wow, it's possible that with like climate change, uh, we could probably maybe see some or see something like that happen in a- Antarctica. Yeah. Maybe there's like a a new element like Shackleton. Onium yeah. <laughs> that they discovered down there, or but, like just tons of uh, of of s- surge. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> this uh, expedition from the eighties uh, <laughs> just can't surge. Brought, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I don't know if I want ever want to go to Antarctica. I don't know. I don't know, man. Um, we haven't really done a great job selling. It. <laughs> no, no, I would take a ski doo down there. Yeah, Ski-doo. oh yeah. Uh, yeah. That'd be kind of cool. Go to the Sandwich Islands. Yeah, well, yeah. Yum, they yum, probably yum. have like, I mean, I bet Quiznos is still open. Down there. <laughs> so is there? So is there gold there? Is there? What? What is the? What's? The, are there any metals that? Because I, it sounded like the U.S. wanted it only because they didn't want the Germans having it. Yeah. Right. But is there anything under that icy crust? Oil? Well, I think if there was, then. There would definitely be some sort of claims to it, you know. They're think, probably just waiting for the earth to heat up enough to where it's a little bit warmer down there, yeah. and then you can do some stuff. I think, I think as like a strategic point, it makes sense because you, it like you kind of have access to anywhere from it. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about. Too. <laughs> <laughs> you have you have access to anywhere south of the equator easily. Yeah, yeah. The north part. Yeah. This is the opposite side. Yeah. <laughs> well, you just go through the earth then. Yeah. There's a tube going from the North Pole to the South Pole. <laughs> yeah. And there's South Pole Santa. You guys know about oh, him? Oh, yeah. You guys know about Jeff. South Pole Santa? <laughs> Jeff Claus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jeff Claus. He comes and takes your presents. <laughs> so it's thank you so much for listening. Again, um, I love I love that we get to do this. Uh, leave us a great review on iTunes. That really helps us out. Um, I'm Nolan Sykes. I'm Joe Weber. You can find me at dark underscore webinar 
Instagram? I'm Jeremiah Burton. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Jeremiah Burton. Also, last podcast, I had some people hit me up. I guess I said I was from Brevard County. Three, two, one, countdown county. Hello, family. <laughs> oh, right. good shout out. <laughs> yeah, great. Hey, uh, yeah. Also, we have a, uh, we, if you didn't know, we have a YouTube channel also called Donut Media. If you haven't watched our videos, you probably like them if you like this podcast. Um, so go check that out. Give us a subscribe. It helps us out a lot. Be nice. See you next time. Bye. Thank you. Institute of Technology, which is now the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. Christina's from suburbs of Chicago, <laughs> so she knows where that's at. I just want to point out that's a very California thing to be like. Hey, you know where that's at. Yeah, to be like, oh, I know a guy from Chicago. Do you know him? <laughs> <laughs>